Amos Ramon joins us on segment one here on Inside Pitch. I'm Doug Greenwald, radio play-by-play voice of the Winnipeg Gold Eyes. Amos Ramon is now in his second full season as the Gold Eyes hitting coach. He's lived in Winnipeg for now 13 years, one of the most popular Gold Eyes on and off the field. We discuss some of the players new to this year's team and also the baseball academy he runs. Without further ado, Winnipeg hitting coach Amos Ramon. Back on Inside Pitch, Doug Greenwald with you, and uh, we are joined by a man who's about to enter his uh, second full season as hitting coach with the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, and it's one of the most popular Gold Eyes of all time as a player, now a coach and Winnipeg resident for now 13 years. And Amos Ramon, hard to believe 13 years you've lived in Manitoba. Yeah, it's, uh, to think about it's been that long, it's kind of uh, a little surreal, but uh, no, I love Winnipeg. It's become my home now, and I have some pretty deep roots in Winnipeg, and the uh, city is embracing, and uh, you know, I, I love the win. I love starting to love the winters a little bit. I like them, I guess I should say, but the, the summers for sure are nice. Well, we think summer, we think baseball. And uh, in, in exactly, less than yeah. a month, less than a month, uh, the <laughs> regular season starts at Gary. That's uh, uh, amazing to think about. We'll have a few exhibition games. And of course, want to remind all the fans, the home opener is uh, May 19th. But let's go back. Uh, you know, when you first arrived in Winnipeg in 2006, uh, could you have ever imagined that this eventually would be your full time home? No, no. Uh, to be honest with you, I remember when Rick made the phone call back in in 2006. I had already gone back to uh, up to school to finish my degree at Louisiana Tech, and then Rick had called me and was like, "Hey, I need a backup infielder." I'm like, "Sweet, well, he's I'm I'm with Winnipeg." I'm like, "By the way, where's Winnipeg?" And I had no idea it was where in Canada, and uh, now it's become my home. And, and uh, no, I had no, didn't ever think I would be living there or, or what, but it's kind of surreal. I met my wife the first night in Winnipeg, so that place kind of does it to a lot of other guys up there. Uh, but it's, like I said, it's a great city, and, and I'm proud to you know, be a Winnipegger now. Yeah, well, that, that'll change things. That is, uh, that is for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, the, I guess winter is a little different in, in Winnipeg than it is in South Texas. So uh, new season uh, mm-hmm. upon us, and that means uh, a new coaching staff, uh, not you, but uh, Greg Taggart, new manager, and uh, Tom Thornton, uh, the new pitching coach. How well do you know the two of them? Uh, pretty well. Uh, you know, I played against Greg back when, you know, I, when I first got into the uh, league in 06, back in the Northern League. And I've kind of always, you know, been around when we scold eyes and, and playing against uh, Greg and kind of seeing his style. Um, I think I played against Tom, I want to say, back in the day. Uh, I can't remember exactly. So I, and the last two years, uh, Thornton's been with, uh, with, with Gary. And I've known Greg for a while. Greg's a great guy. I've known his, some of his other coaches that he's had in place before with me and Gary. So I, I've kind of known him. Him and Rick are really good friends. So me, me and Rick talk, and it was always – he would talk about conversations with Greg he, he has. So, um, no, I, 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 I know him pretty well and, and I'm excited to work with them and get going. And you mentioned Rick Forney. I mean, uh, I know you've been in Winnipeg 13 years. He blows you away in terms of uh, his time in Winnipeg, whether it be as a player, a coach, <laughs> yeah. or a manager, 26 years. And I know he's going over to the Atlantic league now to, to York, Pennsylvania, yeah. but uh, there, that would be a whole different story or, or interview about Rick Forney stories. But uh, just what did Rick mean to the organization and the city? Oh, a, a lot. You know, uh, Rick, uh, it's funny because now to think about it and kind of going back, and I was actually there for work, uh, Rick's um, first season as manager, and then I was there again as his hitting coach in his last season as manager. So it's kind of a full circle for me uh, to kind of see how he transitioned. But, you know, like Rick did an amazing job there. You know, he brought three championships to Winnipeg back when my, our first one in 12 when I was there, and then 16 and 17. So it's great he was able to do that and bring in. And he's always the kind of guy – that's, uh, it's always about winning with him and Rick, but he's a pure professional. And, and I loved Rick, and he brought me into the game of professionally, brought me into the game as a, as a coach as well professionally. So I can't say enough about him and thanks to him. Uh, but he did a lot for the city. And he did a lot for the Gold Eyes as a player and then as a, as a pitching coach and then as a manager. Uh, and so he's built a foundation there in the last, you know, like you said, 25 years, or 20, whatever it's been. Um, but, yeah, he's done a great things. And I'm, but I'm excited for the next chapter for Winnipeg. And, with Greg and and Thornton, and I'm excited to see what's going to happen. And obviously Greg signs players and Tom recommends guys. How much say do you have with, uh, with player signings? Uh, A little, not a lot. Uh, I fight see some guys that, you know, the thing with now, what I've noticed here as Dean hitting coaches, you're going to get a lot of these texts and a lot of these, Hey, I, I, I played here. I played there. 
and you kind of have to do some digging and you kind of recommend players that you kind of know or people that you know that you trust. Um, so, uh, I just kind of recommend them to Greg. If I see somebody, Craig kind of does his full due diligence on players and, and he kind of does all that. Um, you know, sometimes Greg and, and Rick had asked me a few times about some players, what I thought, but, um, you know, not a whole lot, uh, I'd rather let them do, but if, if there's somebody that I see that I like that I would want to recommend, I recommend them. And then Greg, uh, would then follow up and do, like I said, his due diligence on players and, and then make the signing if he likes them. We're with Winnipeg Gold Eyes hitting coach uh, Amos Ramon uh, getting ready for uh, this season, which uh, starts officially in less than a month now, May 11th at uh, uh, Gary. So the uh, Gold Eyes make the playoffs last year, lost in the first round, and uh, uh, a man that helped carry you to the playoffs, who unfortunately had the uh, uh, injury in the in the first round. But Max Murphy returns, uh, the league MVP from a year ago, uh, 31 home runs uh, last year. Uh, I know Max spends a great deal of time up in Winnipeg in the winter. How often have you, uh, you two connected this off season? Uh, we did quite a bit. Uh, I think, uh, before he left, I think he went back to Minnesota, uh, like for, I think he was there until early March and he went back to Minnesota, but he's coming back here, I guess, towards the end of April. Um, you know, we connected quite a bit. Um, you know, he, he's been working a lot with, uh, he works at the facility with us too, does some, uh, or kind of does some training there for himself. And so it's, it's been good to see him, you know, getting back on his feet and kind of hitting the baseball and kind of get going again. So he, um, he will return um, a few new faces, obviously with, I don't mean just with Greg Tiger, but with a new manager, there'll be some uh, new faces. Uh, a guy you saw a little bit last year, Javion Williams, who's an outfielder. Uh, what can we, uh, what do you know about him? Uh, not a whole lot, to be honest with you. I, I kind of, I'm trying to go back in my brain and kind of remember, you know, Jay, Javon Williams. But um, I, to be honest with you, I, there's not a whole lot. I, I, think, I can't think of anything. But, I mean, I'm sure I talked to Greg a little bit, speedy guy. So uh, that's the thing we kind of need. We kind of need some speed. Like Greg, Greg's the kind of guy who's going to like to run the bases, kind of get some offense moving, um, you know, him. So uh, it'll be good to see him kind of get on. And, and you know, we, he's going to have some shoes to fill with um, – you know, with uh, with Reggie leaving, so I think he can kind of fill that spot. So it be interesting to see how he does out there in center field. And then on the pitching side, and uh, Travis Seabrook's going to join us later uh, uh, in uh, inside pitch. Six and zero last year. He's won nine games over the two years. Um, just what uh, he's meant to the club. Uh, Travis has been great. He's always been our, our later kind of innings. Uh, you know, he pretty much Rick went to him almost every felt like almost every game you saw Travis getting up uh, and, and you know um, and he's a great he's a great guy very, very hard competitor um, so I've heard some rumblings of possibly starter uh, we'll see uh, but uh, I, I Seabrook's a great guy you know like he was solid in those six seven or seven eight nine innings and especially against lefties and you know he's got a plus fastball and he's got a really good slider so be kind of interesting to see if he does move, if he does go towards that starter role, or if he stays in that, goes back to that seven, eight, nine guy. I think he's a great guy there. So, but I'm sure he'll be well as a starter. So obviously, guys, you'll be working with at the professional level. But your role in the winter time is you get guys ready uh, for uh, college baseball, which of course is predominantly in the United States. Uh, yeah. College development uh, players. You have the uh, home run sports uh, training center. Uh, how long have you worked uh, there? And uh, what goes on and getting players ready to, to go to the next level. Yeah. Like we've been, I've been there for about oh, every, I guess pretty much ever since I've been in Winnipeg, uh, to be honest with you, I've been back when it was rookies and I helped out and, and now I've been there more predominantly as the, as the head coach of 19, the varsity program, as we, we like to call it. Um, you know, we, we, a lot of our guys pretty much go to the Northern States, some Canadian schools as well. Um, and we try to find there's – there's a scholarship for somebody or there's a college baseball program for everybody who wants to go play. And the good thing that we do is we kind of get them ready to, to go that route and, and find them scholarships. And, you know, you'll get some few special players. Um, I like to call them diamonds in the rough here in Winnipeg because um, nobody really knows about them. I mean, being Winnipeg, you think hockey. Canada, you think hockey. So you kind of need guys like me and guys like John Ali who run the, the program there is to kind of help – you know, get those guys out there um, a little bit. And that's what kind of we do. These are a lot of our connections to kind of help these players in Winnipeg get to, you know, live their dream out, play college baseball at the highest level they can. And uh, it's pretty, it's been pretty exciting. So you, you run that and work, work there. And uh, in terms of developing 
uh, players, and then uh, you also have the holiday skills uh, uh, camp. Yeah, we did that this past season. So we did that with the goal guys, me and Max. Is that it was great to see those kids come out, uh, you know, uh, and just get them in there. And I think mean, we had about 120 kids. It was about four sessions we did. But it was great. It's fun. I had my little one there, too. She came out and joined one of the sessions. So it was fun to get going. Uh, but it gets you kind of into that whole gold ice, the gold ice around the corner kind of feeling. Because, uh, you know, we just finished season in, in September. And then just kind of that lull. And then you get into Christmas mode. And then having that, that, that camp there kind of regenerate, you know, that feeling of, okay, here we go. It's coming around again. And then having these sessions, you know, with you and, and then starting to see the sun come out and starting to see Major League Baseball, you're really starting to get the itch about, all right, it's time to get back on the field here. You mentioned your daughter uh, participated in that uh, camp. Uh, was she better than some of the boys? That's what I want to know in terms of playing baseball. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. He asked her, she was the best. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, she loves it. She, she likes being around it for sure. Well, you mentioned uh, all your time in Winnipeg and uh, the American Association slash Northern League uh, has had a lot of changes. I mean, since you first came in, I mean, there's yeah. the Milwaukee area now. Uh, you know, Gary's been a staple. Winnipeg's been a staple. Sioux City, Sioux Falls. But I mean, a lot of teams around that have uh, come and go. Fargo certainly has been a staple as well. So there's been a handful of teams that have been uh, consistent in that league. So you look at the schedule and – no trip to Texas this year. I know. I know. It's funny from a totally different part of Texas, but and Texas is kind of a big state, but still, uh, no trip to Cleburne. I mean, uh, you got to feel rock there. Yeah, a little, a little. Especially if you ask Max Murphy about going to Cleburne. Max loves hitting Cleburne, so he's like, "Man, we don't get to go to Cleburne." I'm like, oh, "Sorry, Max," but uh, yeah, uh, I saw the schedule and I was like, "To be honest with you, I'm okay with not taking that bus all the way down to Cleburne. That's a long drive, so." Uh, to be honest with you, I'm totally okay with it. I, I can go on my off season. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I know I did see the schedule. Because usually my parents, like last year, they came up to, to Cleveland. And so, I mean, it is still a far drive for them. But, you know, be able to have the chance to see them, see some family around the area too. But, uh, no, I'm totally fine with not having to drive all the way down to, to, to Texas. I remember back in the day when we played, when I played, I think we used to start the season like in Amarillo. Um, and then we would go down from Amarillo, we went down to Laredo. Yeah, we went down to Laredo. Uh, and then from Laredo, we went up to El Paso. And then from El Paso, we had two days off, our only two days off in May. And it was just to get back to Winnipeg. Uh, so it was, it was a long trip. Uh, I remember those days. Yeah, back. I think that was our first season, maybe the second season of the American Association. Yeah, back in the day. So I'd have to. As I remember that El Paso did have a stretch of independent league baseball between its two, between going from Double A to yeah to uh, mm-hmm. Triple A. You ought to see the ballpark El Paso has now. It's, I know, uh, unbelievable. I've heard that. Even I've heard even Amarillo's ballpark is super nice. I mean, back in the day, it was older and very like the field wasn't the best to be honest with you. But I've heard now with the I think it's the Sod Poodles, right? I think is who it is there. Yeah, I think it's like I think it's a, a super nice ballpark. See, all those ballparks are super nice now, so it'd be great to get out there and see those things. No, definitely. Uh, I've, I've uh, had called games as a visitor. In fact, I called the first ever game at the current El Paso Ballpark as a, as a visiting uh, broadcaster, and I've been to uh, the current Amarillo Stadium, which is downtown, as a fan. Uh, oh, and both, okay. Uh, both are uh, phenomenal. But let's talk a little about the American Association. Just all the years you've been in the league, and now. Uh, a lot of the changes, uh, I mean, Chicago is in there, Kane County is in there. Uh, what that means to the league with all these new markets? It's great. Uh, you know, like Kane County, uh, that whole little Chicago area, that kind of Midwest area, uh, it's great. Uh, it, it's good for, especially when we go down south, we don't have to travel a lot, kind of in that whole little an hour and a half, two hours of max, you know, and when we go down for us. Uh, but it's great, like seeing ballparks, like Chicago's life little ballpark. Hitters Ballpark, Milwaukee's a nice little area, um, nice little golf court, like little golf, like top golf next to it. it it's it's, it's kind of super nice in that little area. Kane County, you know, Kane County's got some history being in, in, in minor league baseball, and they still draw fans, and I love going there. It's got that old-time, like, baseball minor league feeling. Uh, when you watch, like, Bull Durham, it's got that whole feel to it in Kane County, and I love it. You get there, you smell the – the fire, like the barbecue pits going and you spill those hot dogs. It kind of gives that really old style feeling. The way they do things there is pretty good. It's really good actually. And, and, uh, but having those, those teams in that area and, you know, adding Lake country last year, uh, those, those are great to have those all in that kind of same area. 
with Amos Ramon, uh, hitting coach of the Winnipeg uh, Gold Eyes. And when you first came to to Winnipeg, uh, or maybe I'll flip it around now, you've been there 13 years, and maybe you talk to other players uh, who might be looking – uh, to get into the American Association. What do you tell them about Winnipeg? I don't mean just for the baseball opportunity, but for the city, the stadium, the front office. What do you tell them? Top notch. <clears throat> Zach, uh, I, still, I still say, we always say this, is the Yankees of independent baseball. I mean, the, the organization, I can't speak highly enough of them and how they run things. And, and with, you know, with Sam and, and Andrew and, and the whole front office, they're, it's just great on that side. The Jamie, the clubhouse manager, like everything they do, is top notch, you know, they like try to give us the best facilities we can. We got a nice locker, a uh, nice locker room clubhouse with your own. Like I can't tell players you want a gym. It's connected to it. You can go in there and work out whenever you want. You want like, uh, it's just everything. I mean, like even the hotel, I mean, it's the guys it's walking distance from the stadium. I mean, like you want food. It's just all these food. Now you're talking about the city in general. And then you have the fans and I can't say enough about the fans. They embrace you just like, you know, like you're, you're their own kids a lot of the time. And, and um, it's great uh, to have that organization there. And it means a lot to the city. It's got a lot of history. And uh, I tell these guys, you know, like it's a really good place to play baseball. Um, the city's growing downtown. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And it's just great to be a Winnipegger now and, and to see all that developing. And, and I just tell players, like, you'll be excited because it, it, it's busy, a lot of fans, and it's just really good baseball. Yeah, that's what everyone uh, tells me and can't wait to – to uh, experience it uh, firsthand, uh, August 11th, and you talk about the fans and the promotions and the fireworks nights and, and you know, things like that. But August 11th ought to be a, a pretty special night because they're going to honor uh, Reggie. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's part of the 30-year uh, promotion. So they're going to retire his, his jersey, number 11. And uh, you better get there quick uh, before all the fans get there because the first 1,000 fans get a Reggie Abercrombie bobblehead so i hope you're in line uh there amos yeah yeah hopefully i can sneak one in i i actually uh was with reggie I, i've known reggie for a while i played against reggie one and then i had him we were together in spring in, in 14 he was actually my locker mate in 14 great guy can't say enough the guy's he's phenomenal and, and good for him and he deserves it and he put us some big numbers and he did some great things for the for not only the organization but for american association in general so it's great to see him be honored on that day and i can't wait to see him again yeah, I'm excited to meet him. I, I certainly remember him, uh, you know, no, no, <laughs> him. Uh, but uh, no, it'll be a lot of uh, uh, promotions. You got uh, Oktoberfest, you got Country Night, uh, uh, obviously all the, the fireworks uh, nights. And uh, just, you know, when you're, you mentioned all the, how great the fans are there. I mean, does that just get your blood going? Just even as a coach to, to look up there and, and know that you got a packed house. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's great. It's, like I said, it's a great ballpark. And, there's nothing better than playing in front of fans and especially Winnipeg fans that, you know, like they just love being there, especially we love being in the sun. Cause we, like I said, we don't get it for about six months. It feels like uh, being on and being so cold in Winnipeg. So anytime we have a chance to go outside and be in shorts and a tank top, and we will do anything we can to be out in that kind of weather. So it's great having the ballpark there and, and, uh, and I can't wait for it. So getting back to your 13 years in, in Winnipeg and uh, we just had the WBC, I know you grew up in the United States, uh, but, uh, you know, you're pulling for Canada, you're pulling for U.S. Uh, do you have a little Hispanic? Uh, uh, Ramon is, is your Yeah, favorite. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican, so I was kind of rooting for U.S., Mexico, Canada, whoever was up in that top, to be honest with you. I actually got – I was lucky enough because we take, our, uh, we take our, our team down to Arizona, and I was lucky enough we got to go to a WBC game, uh, USA versus Columbia – we were able to see that tight ball game. I think it was three to two ball game USA won, but it's just great seeing those, 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 you know, those games were meaningful baseball in March and you don't see that till September, October. Um, and it just kind of gets, again, the blood going, okay, it's like, it's, I want to be like that. And I, I, you know, I kind of wish all of baseball 162 games were like that a lot, uh, not just the last month or, you know, uh, it, cause that's, that's fun baseball for everybody. See that excitement, even the crowd. I know Columbia was already pretty much out of it when they were playing just to qualify for the polling, but the crowd was into it. And that kind of crowd, like that's what you see mostly like Mexican, you know, those Mexican leagues and uh, how loud they are with the drums and, and everything. It was just kind of cool to see all that. Yeah. I, I, I've been to a few of those games. In fact, I saw 
uh, James Talion, even though he grew up in Houston, uh, but he was born in Canada. I remember he pitched for Team Canada against USA. I saw one of their games in uh, 2013. It's a it's a great atmosphere, and I've always thought that the the Canadians have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, especially going up against the Americans. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, well, Amos. Uh, Really appreciate uh, your time, and we've had a busy week. You went down to Minnesota to see the home opener uh, with uh, the Twins playing the Astros, and uh, look forward to meeting you and, and working with you and the staff uh, this season. Appreciate it. Yeah, I can't wait. Thanks, Doug. Nice. Thanks for having me. Amos Ramon, our uh, guest here on Inside Pitch. We'll be back with more in a moment. Back on Inside Pitch, segment number two, and we're with a man who uh, is going to be new to the Gold Eyes this year, although he played a couple of games against Winnipeg last year and that's outfielder uh, Javian Williams and thanks for joining us. So I know you're down in Louisiana and I know uh, you're from uh, Robe Ridge right outside of Lafayette. So it's crawfish season and Robe Ridge is known for the capital of crawfish. I mean, you want crawfish, you go to Robe Ridge, great festivals. So uh, uh are the bra- are the uh crawfish uh, in season right now? Yes, sir. It actually is in season is probably became uh season began began about um about a month ago, so yeah, the crawfish is uh, is rolling right now. And uh, I've lived in uh, South Louisiana a little bit. Uh, I've lived in Lafayette for a year, and then I've lived in North Louisiana as well. I've lived in Shreveport, so I'm definitely familiar with the area. I've been through uh, Bro Bridge and and love the food down there. We'll talk about that though uh, later. Let's talk some baseball and let's talk some Winnipeg Gold Eyes uh, baseball. So you were in the American Association last year. Uh, you were injured much of the year, but you played a couple of games for Gary. Well, played more than two games for Gary, but two of them were in Winnipeg. Uh, yes, so what do you remember about uh, going to Winnipeg as a visiting player? Oh, man, the, one, the first thing that stuck out to me had to be the uh, the fight team. Um, I actually like the uh, the city Winnipeg, Winnipeg, and I love the stadium. I love this, um, the, uh, the buildings behind center field. I thought that was pretty cool. And I always thought that the stadium was very electric. I uh, ended up making a joke to one of my friends talking about, I love Canada. And I wouldn't mind playing for him because of how interactive the fans were and how attentive the fans were. Um, and one thing that stuck out was in summer, it was very, very, very beautiful. Um, it had, uh, it wasn't too hot. No, it wasn't too cold. But the only weird thing it was, it didn't get, it didn't get dark until like 10 o'clock. Like we were playing the games and it was still, it was still daytime, but I thought that the um the stadium and the and the and the fans for the most part were were, were very electric. I love that place. Yeah, I uh, I've heard the same. And as I said, you and I are you've had a little time in Winnipeg. Uh, I've yet to visit uh, uh, Winnipeg. I will do so in a few days. But uh, I've heard that it stays light uh, till late, and that uh, for you coming from Louisiana originally, we know how hot and sticky and humid it is down there. So it must be a little refreshing to to play up in the north. Uh, a little bit. So uh, your first year with the Gold Eyes, how did it come to be that you signed with Winnipeg? Um, just my agent uh, were reaching out for teams and um, the manager, uh, Taggart, uh, actually was the member, I mean, the manager of the uh, Gary South Shore Railcats. And when he got the job at uh, at Winnipeg, I'm pretty sure he's looking for some guys and uh, asked a couple guys as well as my manager um, about me um, as well as my agent. And through, I also played with the Giants, and through that, uh, with all those uh, connections I made, uh, he was able to reach out to me, come to an agreement, and then that's how I landed in Winnipeg. And uh, you mentioned Greg Tigert. Uh, it's kind of coincidental because uh, he managed in Gary for 15 years, but not last year when you uh, played right. there, but there's the Gary connection. Of course, pitching coach Tom Thornton uh, as well. Uh, so you're going to join the Gold Ice. How many of the players on the team do you know? I actually know three. Um, I know two that's from Gary South Shore Railcats. I know, um, I know the first baseman, uh, Burgess, and I also know the catcher. Uh, he's going to hate me because I can't think of his name right now. I don't know why I can't think of his name. It's on the top of my tongue, but I also know another outfielder that we also signed. We also, we actually uh, got drafted together with the San Francisco Giants. His name is Najee Harris. So I know three guys over there that I'm going to be playing with. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm going to be a new face, but at least I have some people with me. Yeah, that obviously Jackson, uh, Jackson is the catcher. I'm so sorry, Jackson. I love him. All right, but uh, yeah, and you mentioned uh, coming from the uh, from the Giants, uh, and you got as high up there as uh, Eugene, and hopefully you'll get back up to organizational ball somewhere. Uh, that's really the goal of of the uh, of the MLB partner leagues is to 
to get recognized uh, again or maybe for the first time to get back into organized ball. But uh, the Giants have such a uh, great tradition, and, and sometimes, and a lot of major league teams do this, they'll maybe call up a guy to partake in a big league spring game. Did you have that chance? Uh, I did not have that chance, honestly. Uh, I was all uh, just in minor league uh, spring training, so I didn't get that opportunity to play in the major league uh, spring game. But uh, the uh, uh, fact you were with them for a little bit and then and the organization for a little bit and then uh, independent ball last year, what did you find the, to be the biggest difference, uh, the way things are run between being an organized ball and uh, and in an MLB partner league? Um, you have to be extremely disciplined. Um, in affiliate ball, there's a lot of, okay, we have a strength and conditioning coach. You have to get your, your card signed saying that you, that you went work out. And with independent ball, it was all about discipline. You wake up when you want to, you work out if you want to. It's a lot of discipline. And, uh, that's, that's what I loved about independent ball was that allowed me to understand that if I want to be a great player, that I have to hold myself accountable. So it's discipline was the biggest thing for me. Yeah. Obviously that. And as I often say in, in, uh, organized ball, you, you have to wait for the manager to do all his game reports. Uh, right. whereas, uh, uh, you know, you don't so much in, um, in MLB, uh, uh, partner leagues. So, uh, getting back to, uh, your background a little bit, uh, you know, coming to, uh, coming from Louisiana, I uh, grew up in Bro Bridge. And again, those of you listening, uh, when I saw that, uh, Javen's from Bro Bridge and, you know, again, I'm a Californian, but yeah, definitely, definitely have been, uh, through there. Great food, and Canada's got great food as well. So what is your favorite uh, Creole or Cajun dish? Uh, I have to be a shrimp etouffee. I have to be a shrimp etouffee. I love crawfish, but something about a shrimp etouffee, it, it gets me. Uh, my mom makes it. It's, it's, it's top tier. It's, it's, not, it's not for the baby. Well, have her send some up to Winnipeg, or if she comes up, have her bring – Bring some. I love shrimp etouffee. I love crawfish etouffee. I'm a po' boy guy. Pretty much. I don't do. I don't eat alligator. Everyone says alligator tastes just like chicken. I'll take their word for it. But <laughs> something about uh, about that. So you're growing up in in South Louisiana, and I understand you were a wide receiver at uh, Brobridge High School. Uh, did you get any uh, looks uh, for college football? I actually did. I got a couple D three um, people that want to give me uh, offers and a couple walk on um, D ones, but I just didn't want to take them. So. Yeah. yeah, I got a couple Yeah, I understand, but uh, you know, I have a chance to go play Division One baseball, and we'll certainly talk about that in a in a moment. But we know that that high school football in Canada is not really all that big, certainly compared to the United States, and certainly compared to the South and Louisiana. I'm going to keep narrowing it down. But what that environment is like, you know, they talk about Friday night lights in Texas. Louisiana's got a chip on their shoulder because Texas is the neighboring state, and there's always debates on. On who's better, Texas is bigger, but Louisiana probably has as good of uh, a crew of uh, athletes as well. But what's that like playing high school football in the South on those Friday nights? Honestly, it's exactly what you see on TV. Um, Friday, almost everything shuts down, and people just want to get out of the way and come watch some football. It's very competitive, um, but just like Texas, we have dogs too. The only difference is we have a selective people, a selective amount of people because we're not as big. But Friday Night Lights is definitely how you see it on TV. It's very electrifying. Um, we live for that moment. On summers, we watch Friday Night Lights all the time just because of the atmosphere of what we play in. Um, you see a lot of guys that come back, especially that played on your, uh, that played with your team back in the years, as well as the rivals. So, uh, not only do you face the teams, you also have to face the fans because it does get, it does get hyped and it does get heated at times. So it's very competitive. Yeah, I mean it's that is the the way of life, especially in a small town like Bro Bridge, uh, because that's that's pretty much the the big thing there. There in the uh, the Crofters. So you you didn't really go all that far away to school, maybe an hour over to uh, to Baton Rouge, and you know folks think that uh, there is only one college in Baton Rouge. We won't mention that college, and we'll just call them the school across town. We'll leave it at that. But you went to Southern, and that's got great baseball tradition, great tradition in all sports, uh, but. Uh, known as an HBCU um, and great athletes and, and good academic institutions and historically black colleges and universities for those listening in, in Winnipeg, there are schools like Southern and we'll mention Grambling. You're in the same conference as them. I know it's a rival, but uh, you know, schools like that Howard university, for example, and the coach who recruited you as a man who's done so much good for African-Americans in baseball uh, college or otherwise, and that's Roger Cador. Uh, he retired midway through your time there. 
But, I mean, he's a legend in college baseball. Right. He definitely is. Uh, he's definitely like an, an iconic figure, especially in HBCU baseball. To be honest, I, uh, around college baseball, um, he's a very great guy on and off the field. He cares for you on and off the field. I have nothing but respect for him. He's been one, of the, one of the biggest reasons why I went to Southern University because when we first talked to him, he was just down to earth and he was real. Um, a lot of guys try to sell you a dream him to get you to come to this school. Now, he just told you straight up on how things work, on how he operated. And for me, that's one of the biggest things is the realness of a coach. Like, you don't have to tell me I'm going to be the best player, right? You have to tell me I'm going to work my butt off. And I respect that. And that's one thing about him. He told the real and he wasn't afraid to tell you exactly where you were in that place and how to get better. So, um, Roger Carroll had the utmost respect for me. And um, to this day, I still thank him for, my, for, for recruiting me to go to Southern University. Yeah, I think you and so many, and, and they've had Hall of Famers like Lou Brock played at Southern, uh, the great pitcher Vita Blue. I miss way before your time, but you know, a couple more modern play Ricky Weeks. Uh, recently, Fred Lewis, who had a good big league career, including Fred played with the, the Toronto Blue Jays. I covered Fred when he came up to the Giant system in and, and Fresno, so they've had I mean, a lot of great players come through. Southern, a lot of NCAA teams, and you played on an NCAA uh, a tournament uh, team with uh, you were in the Mississippi State region, and I know the team didn't do as well as it had hoped, but uh, individually you did. You, what, you went six for six over the two games uh, against, what was it, Miami and Mississippi State? Sir. I went six for six, um, three doubles, and the only time I got out was a side fly to the wall. Um, yeah, a side fly to the wall against Mississippi State. And what was that experience like playing in, the, in that tournament? I mean, Mississippi State's got obviously a great – Great pedigree and um, beautiful state. I've not been to that stadium, but everyone says it's a great ballpark. But just what it, it was like to to play in that environment. And not only are you representing Southern, but I'm going to go back to the fact that it's only one to two schools in the field of 64 that you're uh, you're representing uh, the uh, the HBCU group. Oh man, to be honest, I'm very biased. I thought that was probably the best stadium of ever, the best atmosphere that I played in by far. Um, there was a sold out crowd against Mississippi State and their fans are just so electrifying. I remember, um, beating them. We were beating them four to two and the stadium was quiet, but the minute they took the lead, it got loud. I mean, I looked at my right fielder and I'm talking about the ground was shaking and I was literally telling them this is baseball. Um, so they had my utmost respect as well. At the end of the game, they gave us very great praise for even being in that game. So, um, I think that that also gave me an idea what it's like to play in a pro game because we never had that many fans and they came up and it was just, it was just an electrifying crowd. Yeah. That, uh, you know, it was an exciting year for you. Not only to obviously win the SWAC, that's for those listening to the Southwestern athletic conference, uh, yet to the NCAA tournament. And again, with you, uh, you made an all Louisiana team. It was comprised of players, which included, uh, uh, guys that played at the school across town from Southern, uh, but uh, all across the state, regardless, D1, D3, and what it was like to have your name on that all-Louisiana roster. Uh, honestly, it was great recognition because of uh, all the hard work that we put in. Um, my coach definitely told me that that would be achievable if I just believed in his plan. Um, so it was pretty great to see at the end of the day that, by the way, guys, if you want to know what schools he's talking about, he's talking about Louisiana State University, LSU. I'm at the give it y'all roses, go Tigers. Um, but it was very great to see that, you know, um, I was able to be that guy, you know, that was all one of those guys to even be recognized with those competitive teams in the state of Louisiana. So it was very great recognition, I'll say. We're with Winnipeg Gold Eyes uh, outfielder uh, Javion Williams uh, on Inside Pitch, segment two. I'm Doug Greenwald, the new radio voice of the uh, Gold Eyes, talking about Javion's time playing in the uh, playing at Southern University. And we'll go. Uh, I mentioned the HBCU. I'm going to touch on that a little bit again in a moment. I'm going to seesaw back to to Winnipeg, though, and uh, manager Greg Tigert, and we talked about he managing Gary. You played in Gary, albeit at different times. Uh, but how well do you know Greg? How well do you know uh, the new hitting coach, uh, Amos Ramon, and then uh, the pitching coach, Tom Thornton? So you had two new staff members. You're new. I'm new. Uh, Amos has been there for a while, but how well do you know the staff? Uh, to be honest, I don't know Greg that much, uh, Greg Target that, that much because obviously I haven't played with him. I only heard much about him because most of his players that he coached, uh, that previously or before he, um, he, uh, 
parted ways with the team. Some of them played, so they told me about him. I don't know much about the hitting coach. I don't know him, but the person I do know is uh, the pitching coach, Thornton. Um, we had great talks with each other. He told me how much he loved me and how much I backed his pitches up. So that was pretty cool to see him out there, uh, especially because, you know, um, it's cool knowing that he has, you know, um, faith in me to back his pitches up. So, um, just like you, I'm fairly new there, but, uh, out of two, out of three of them, I only know one. That's right. You and Tom were together and I overlooked that in the, uh, Gary last uh, season. You go back to your time with the, the Giants. And I know that you spent some time playing in that Arizona summer league. Uh, but when they uh, promoted you, went up to Eugene, that's the high A club. Uh, what was it like playing on the West Coast for you for the first time? Because that's a long way from Bro Bridge. Uh, very unique, I should say. It's a long way from Bro Bridge. Um, I'll just say the, uh, the Northwest and the South are very, very different. Um, but I liked how green it was. I love the mountains. I love the atmosphere that they had. It was a very free atmosphere. Um, it was cold in the beginning. I will say that though. It was very cold. I'm not that great with cold. I don't do well with cold. Uh, but you know, it was very new for me. I haven't played in the cold, uh, at all, but it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool to be there. Yeah. It's always fun to see a new place and, Again, I'm excited to see Winnipeg because, uh, as I said, I'd never been to to uh, Manitoba. So here we are uh, recording uh, or talking on uh, on April 12th. Three days from now is Jackie Robinson Day, uh, right. April 15th, uh, when he broke the uh, Major League Baseball uh, color barrier. So 76 years it's been. Uh, but uh, a lot of people, you know, I, I think Canadian baseball historians definitely know this. That Jackie Robinson, when he first played organized baseball, after he played in the Negro Leagues, when the Dodgers signed him, he played in Montreal. And it was right. from Montreal that he eventually went up to, to Brooklyn and, and have a Hall of Fame career of historic uh, proportions. So when I mention the name Jackie Robinson, if, if he could come back to Earth and you could have a conversation with him, what would you say to him? Well, first thing first, I'll tell him thank you, just because at the end of the day, being that only guy in that kind of league at that time um, – uh, along with the physical abuse, there's a lot of mental abuse, you know, because so many people were saying that he didn't belong. But one thing I would probably ask him is how did he deal with that? Because obviously going through all that and still performing the way he performed, it took a lot of mental strength. A lot of people don't talk about mental strength in baseball, but I've realized that's one of the biggest tools that you have to have is mental capacity to to take the things that's trying to overwhelm you and to kind of just bring it down to earth. So I asked him how how he did that. And how was he able to overcome it all? So first thing first, I would thank him and then ask him a couple of questions about how was it and what was it like? And did he ever doubt himself? And what did he do when he doubted himself? Yeah, definitely. You can learn a lot from him, what he went through off the field. I think a lot of us know what he did on the field and, and what he's done long term uh, for the game. But uh, it was it was Canada that really gave him the, the, the chance, the Dodger system, but obviously the country of Canada where uh, once he, as I said, got into organized baseball, uh, that that paved his way. And, and whether you go to the Canadian Hall of Fame, obviously the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, but the the Canadian Hall of Fame, uh, no doubt about it. I mean, Jackie Robinson is uh, one of the prime guys right there, and uh, definitely what the country did and what he did. I mean, for for baseball in Canada, really, uh, you know, almost side by side, right. To, Right there. But you're coming back from uh, injury. Uh, what uh, what have you been doing this off season to, to get back uh, in the game shape? Oh, man. Uh, after the last year, it was kind of brutal uh, for me. It was just get back on track. So a lot of weightlifting, a lot of um, physical therapy, um, a lot of, uh, like I said, isolating uh, the parts that I felt as was weak. And like I said, just getting my body back to back and ready. So gaining more weight, um, continuing to work on my speed. And uh, like I said, just get ready, um, as in like physically to where when I get there is no setback. Well, we're glad to see you back out there and, and look forward to working with you this season and definitely uh, appreciate uh, the time. Enjoy the crawfish uh, down there. And as I said, if uh, your family coming up uh, to Winnipeg, have them bring some Cajun food up there. I'm a big fan of, uh, of uh, Le Bon Temp and Lafayette and Prejean's up uh near Opelousas, so a uh, big fan of both those uh, restaurants. So, Javion, thank you. Hey, yeah, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, they'll definitely be there, though. They they got their passports, and my dad loves to cook, so trust me, he's going to be cooking. All right, good. Well, uh, we'll have him bring some stuff up up to the booth. Javion okay. uh, Williams, our guest uh, on, the, uh, on Inside Pitch. We'll be back with uh, Segment 3, pitcher Travis Seabrook, in just a moment. 
Inside Pitch continues, segment number three, and uh, we are joined by Travis Seabrook, who is a very familiar face to those in uh, Winnipeg and throughout Canada. And uh, coming up on year number three with the uh, Gold Eyes. And before we start, I want to correct one thing. I had interviewed uh, the hitting coach, uh, Amos Ramon, earlier in this uh, uh, show, and I said you had gone 6-0 and last year. It was two years ago you were 6-0 and and 3-2 and last season. But I did have you for nine total wins as a Gold Eye. Uh, one way or another, but thank you for joining us, and uh, let's uh, catch everybody up. I know a lot of Gold Eye fans are curious uh, to know what you've been up to this winter. Yeah, well, first off, to, thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's nice to you know to to meet you and come on here and be able to talk. Um, but yeah, I've just been um, this off season. Uh, I've been going to school full time at Florida State uh, down in Tallahassee, and I've uh, just been going to school and doing training and throwing and um getting ready to start throwing live here uh, for the next month or so, I guess, before I finally get up to Winnipeg. So, Are uh, you allowed to work out with the – I mean, you're not playing for Florida State, obviously, but are you allowed to use their uh, facility? Uh, no, I haven't had any any affiliation with their team at all. Uh, there's been a training facility that's a couple minutes down the road from me called Power Mill. Uh, I came across it actually a couple of years ago when I had first moved down here to go to school, and that's where I've been doing most of my training. Uh, in the off season to throw my bullpens and and whatnot. So, and congratulations on working toward your degree. I know you have another year after this, but that'll be very exciting when you get that uh, uh, piece of paper. So, year number three coming up with uh, Winnipeg, and you know you wear that Winnipeg jersey, and there's a maple leaf on it, and there's a maple leaf on the hat, and that's the country where you grew up. And and a lot of the Gold Eye players, most are not from Canada, but you're an exception. And what is it like for you when you put on that Jersey every day and you see your country emblem on it? Well, it's, it's a really special privilege. I think um, just, you know, I, growing up in Canada and having played baseball um, throughout most of my childhood in Canada or in Canada um, to be able to have that kind of correlation into, you know, when I got drafted and moved to come play in the United States um, professionally, playing in a different country, not being in Canada anymore. Um, I think it's just a really, it was a really good opportunity for me to come back and, and play on Canadian soil again in front of Canadian fans. Um, so seeing the Maple Leaf on our Jersey and wearing it on the hat, I think is it's represents a lot for me. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, you take a look, especially this year with the WBC, um, just how stupid question on my part won't be my first, but just when you watch those games and I'm guessing you did, or at least followed it. Uh, I think a lot of countries, you know, there's some countries that uh, might not be as into it. Uh, but just, uh, when you, you watch those guys take the field in the red uniforms and the maple leaf, just get that, get, get you flowing ready for the season. And, and again, I'll use the term country pride. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's, the WBC in general, I mean, all the teams that play in there, um, it's different playing and representing your country. You know, I mean, everybody always wants to go out and they want to represent themselves well. They want to represent their organization well. Um, but it's just it feels like a, a bigger, a bigger beast, if you will, um, getting to play with your country um, across your chest. It, it means a lot. You know, it's it's something that I think a lot of people in sport um, dream of being able to do. Um, so anytime that, you know, you get the opportunity to do that, um, in any, in any sort of fashion, I think it's really special. And you got to do that, uh, over 10 years ago, uh, the under 18 baseball world cup in South Korea, again, 2012, 2013 world baseball cup under 18 group in, uh, Taiwan, uh, second place finish to, to team USA. And, and, uh, I think those games are always a lot of fun when Canada plays the U S whether it be in hockey whether it be in baseball. And I always, I always feel that in hockey, it's the U.S. team that has the chip on the shoulder, and in baseball, it's the Canadian group that has the chip on the shoulder. But what was it like to play international competition against the U.S.? It was a, it was a really cool experience. Um, I'd like, I, just to be able to go um, to some of those different parts of the world um, and, and see different cultures and experience different cities and different people and stuff, I think was a really cool experience in itself. And then to just get to play um, and compete at a, at a really, really high level, you know, against the best set for your age group, um, you know, in the world. Uh, it was just a really, really, really special experience, and uh, it was a lot of fun. The games are very, very, very competitive. So that was, as an athlete and as a competitor, it was really fun to be a part of. You know, I was talking to, uh, you know, other people that have, have played internationally, and 
you know, again, I mentioned South Korea and Taiwan. Obviously, you've played in Canada. You play professionally in the United States. Uh, where else have you played? Uh, where else has baseball uh, taken you? What other countries? Uh, well, I've been uh, a couple of the trips I went to when I played with the junior national team. Uh, we used to go to the Dominican Republic every year in May. Um, so I've been there twice. Uh, we went to Australia. Uh, we also went to Italy. Uh, and then Seoul, Korea and Taiwan were where we had the two uh, world championships. So right there, that's uh, at least three continents you've had a chance to uh, to play. And I've always loved to go to the Dominican. I never have, but uh, it's great how where baseball takes you, which includes Winnipeg. And again, your season number three coming up for you there. Uh, you grew up, uh, what, Peterborough, about an hour and a half east of Toronto. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so you grew up in Ontario. But how often did you get to Winnipeg prior to joining the Gold Eyes? Uh, that coming to Winnipeg to play for the Gold Eyes was my first time uh, having been in Winnipeg. I actually haven't traveled um, really that far west um, to that the western part of Canada um, until I came to play in Winnipeg. Um, so that was a first time experience for me, and I've been loving it. And I was going to ask you about that. I mean, I don't mean just on the field, but uh, your impressions of the the city and the fans and the stadium, just really the environment outside of the lines. Yeah, well, I think um, as far as our our fan base goes um, and the amount of support that we get from the city of Winnipeg um, has been tremendous. I think that's one of the biggest um, attractions for players to want to come and play in Winnipeg because we have such a good fan base. Um, so it's always fun to just be able to play in front of a big crowd and, and to you know see people get involved in what we're doing. Um, but outside of that, um, the city has been – uh, it, it's been really enjoyable for me to live in. I think where we stay, uh, right, we're right downtown, um, in the middle of the city. There's lots of things to go and do, lots of good places to go and eat. Um, so that part of it has been, uh, really, really, really special because a lot of, not every place, um, that we play in, not all the cities have that, um, have that many options and things available to them. Um, so to kind of have all of it, like we can walk to and from the field. Um, like I said, there's lots of things to go and do. There's golf courses around that some guys like to go play at, um, during our off days, lots of good restaurants, eateries and stuff. And, um, so there's definitely a lot to do, um, outside of the baseball part of it. Um, so I just, I've really, really embraced the city and I've, I've very much enjoyed my time living there. Yeah. It's fascinating to, to, you know, talk to people that, that grew up in the same country, but have never been to certain places within uh, that country. And as you say, you had not really been, been west of probably, as you say, Ontario or, or, uh, Winnipeg on west until a few years ago. We're joined by Winnipeg pitcher Travis Seabrook here on Inside Pitch. This is segment uh, three. I'm Doug Greenwald, new radio play by play voice of the Winnipeg, uh, Gold Eyes. All right. So, uh, do you know all the words to O Canada? Could you sing it? Uh, I could. Yes. If I needed to. <laughs> I mean, uh, we saw what Adam Wainwright did on opening day for the Cardinals this year. Uh, he left the the first baseline and went and sang the the national anthem in the in the U.S. But I'm guessing maybe we're not going to see that out of you with O Canada. Uh, you never know. Okay, all right, You're keeping the door open. I don't think I would ever say no if that opportunity <laughs> came. <laughs> now, do you know the words in French also? Uh, I briefly, I think there, there are re some renditions of it that I know. Um, I know when I was in school growing up, uh, we used to, we listened to the anthem every day going to school. And then again, when we came, uh, I got away from it, I guess when I played, um, when I was playing pro ball with Baltimore, cause all our games, we were always in America. They never played the Canadian national anthem. Um, but I definitely do know it. <laughs> um, I, if I had to get up and sing it, I could definitely do that. And I know, most of the verses, I think, in French. <laughs> well, more than I know of, of the Star Spangled Banner, I think. So, uh, no, maybe, maybe we'll maybe we'll see that out of you. That'd be uh, that would be a lot of fun. Uh, different year coming up, though, uh, for you with the uh, Gold Eyes. You're going to have a new manager and a new pitching coach, uh, Greg Taggart. Uh, after years and years in Gary, and then last year was in organized ball with the Giants, managing in their rookie ball uh, team in Arizona, and then Tom Thornton for many years. Uh, was Greg's pitching coach in uh, Gary, and also he played in Gary. So how well do you know Greg, and how well do you know Tom? Um, I don't know either of them actually really well. Um, I know uh, when we played against Gary in 2021, uh, both Greg and Tom were there. Um, so I got to see a little bit about um, 
a little bit about them and how they ran the team and stuff. But uh, from a personal aspect, I've only spoken with Greg um, a couple of times over the phone um, this off season, and I've had some really good conversations with him and I'm very much looking forward for the season to get going. Yeah, it'll be, as I say, a lot of newcomers to, to Winnipeg and uh, you again, going on for your uh, third year. So six and oh, a couple of years ago, and then uh, uh, three wins last season, uh, it's one of those where I think in, in baseball, you know, the starting pitcher gets all the attention because you only have one starting pitcher and you weren't a starting pitcher there. And then the closer gets the attention because he's the last one out there and there's no fine line. I mean, the closer either is going to get it done or he's not. You're more that setup guy where there's some wiggle room and, you know, mm-hmm. you you don't get credit for a save. Uh, you did get your share of wins. But uh, what is it like getting a, getting that ball in the seventh, eighth inning, uh, knowing that it's like, as I say, it's sort of like an offensive lineman in football. There's not really a lot of stats. They don't really get a lot of attention, but you got to have those uh, late innings. Yeah. I, uh, that role that I had um, coming out of the bullpen the last two years, I tried to embrace as much as I could. Um, I have always uh, wanted to be able to impact as many games as I can in any way that I can. And coming out of the bullpen, being in that position, it, it gave me an opportunity where I got to throw a lot, even though I wouldn't come in and wouldn't throw three or four innings at a time, uh, wouldn't get saved, didn't start the games. I still got to come in. Like I, I think I had entered or appeared in 60 out of our hundred games last year. Um, so that was 60 games that I, in one way or another, had some kind of impact in, uh, either good or bad. Um, so that part of it, I think, uh, was something that I really, really enjoyed being in that role was it gave me an opportunity just to play a lot as much as I could. Yeah, and then for our listeners, you do have experience as a starting pitcher professionally. That's when you were the Aberdeen and Delmarva in the in the Orioles chain. You were a, uh, a starter. What was the big adjustment um, for you? And I know you got to throw out 2020 because it didn't happen, at least for the organized minor leagues. Uh, but when you came to be in an MLB partner league where you don't have a major league team attached to the name. What was that big adjustment for you going from the Orioles to um, a a non-affiliate? I think part of it was just independent ball in general, I think gives, gives the players a really good opportunity to work on things that they may or may not have been able to work on as much in a controlled environment in the minor leagues. Um, I feel like we just have a little bit more freedom and in independent ball to try new things, um, to try to work on bettering ourselves and, and some of the components of our game that are a little weaker. Um, so that part of it, I think I really, really liked and I enjoyed it. It was an ad- adjustment for sure, just because there isn't uh, necessarily as much structure. There's definitely not as many eyes on you uh, in independent ball. Um, so I think that it just provides players a, a really good opportunity to come, uh, if they're willing to, to, to take that opportunity, um, to just try and fix them, fix themselves a little bit, fix work on things that maybe they, they lacked or that got them, uh, released or removed out of affiliated ball. Uh, and it also is a really good platform for guys to come in and work on things to try and help get them either into affiliated ball for the first time or re-enter again with another team. Yeah, and uh, that's similar with what Max Murphy said when I asked him the same thing. And uh, as you know, Max played the twin system, and and he had a talk with maybe some newcomers to uh, the MLB partner leagues that were you know let go by a, a major league affiliate. And uh, the other thing Max mentioned though is not a chance, not just a chance to get back into affiliated ball, but. Uh, maybe a chance to showcase for Japan or Korea or Mexico or you know one of the Latin American countries where you can make some more money. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I think it's always. Um, I remember when I had first um, uh, gotten in contact with Rick Forney, our our previous manager with uh, with the Gold Eyes. One of the first things that he told me was he said that coming and playing independent ball is all just about opportunity. Um, so whether that be in affiliated ball or with other, uh, international leagues in Mexico or Japan or Korea or, or elsewhere, um, it's, it's exactly that. It's just, it's, it's a platform to provide players with opportunity. And I think it, as long as you look at it that way, I think it can, uh, really benefit a lot of, a lot of players. Given you an opportunity and an additional opportunity and mentioned you're from Peterborough, uh, Ontario. So, uh, uh, I know already. Talked about it being about 90 minutes east of Toronto. So how often did you get to the Blue Jay games as a kid? 
Uh, I, I got to a few growing up for sure. Um, I did, I definitely did grow up a Blue Jay fan. Um, being able to go to the Rogers Center, uh, a couple times, I guess, every year to see some games and whatnot. But I mean, I was always so busy with my own schedule and with us playing. Uh, we usually had to travel into Toronto to do a lot of our, um, a lot of our sporting events and stuff like that. So I, I definitely spent a lot of time around Toronto, caught a number of games growing up as a kid, and it was always fun when we got to go and see him play. So game's on the line, and uh, you have a choice to face either Freddie Freeman, because he played for Team Canada this year. I guess his mom's Canadian. I guess that's the connection. With uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not actually okay. sure. Uh, but I, obviously he's got family genes because he uh, could play for WBC. Or you're facing Joey Votto, game's on the line. Which, which guy do you want to face? <laughs> um, I think I, probably Joey Votto. I think, I don't know. I just, I, I grew up knowing uh, uh, about Joey Votto more than I have uh, with Freddie Freeman. I mean, they're both, they're both, both of them would be a very fun at bat. <laughs> yeah. I think Votto, of course, uh, again, I'm not really sure where the Freeman roots are in Canada, but, but Votto, you know, is pure Toronto guy through and through. Yep. yep that'd be sure. a, a lot of fun. You talk about uh, the WBC this year and, uh, you know a few of those guys. You mentioned that you grew up with Cal Quantrill, whose dad, Paul, played with the uh, Blue Jays and is also Canadian. I mean, he uh, – uh, I guess Paul, I believe, is from, from British Columbia originally, but played for the Blue Jays. And then uh, Tyler O'Neill, uh, Josh Naylor. So you know a few of the guys that played for the WBC squad. Uh, yeah, I did. We grew up – we played together uh, when we were in high school. And then obviously they've gone on to – to uh, to represent the country in in big league uh, environment and also in the WBC uh, Ontario uh, the home of the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame it's in St Mary's and I know that's a little bit further away from you and further west of uh, Toronto but have you had a chance to see the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame uh, I have actually I was there um, back again when we were in high school uh, when Cal's dad Paul had got inducted into that Hall of Fame. Uh, we were there for that. We got to go and experience that. Um, so that I have been there. I have seen it. Um, it's, it's a really, it's a wonderful place. I think it's really cool. And it was an awesome experience to be able to be there. Yeah. I, uh, loved it. Scott Crawford, who's the director there, uh, showed me around and, and what I like about it is that it's just on the end of a street. It's like on a cul-de-sac and then you, you look past the the museum and there's uh, there's baseball fields right behind it also uh yeah. it's, it's i believe it used to be somebody's house and they they turned it into a museum uh so i got as big a kick out of it as as you did as of uh, uh most uh again being from the peterborough uh you know, how often did you get to the maple leafs games and have you been to any winnipeg jet games uh, I did. I also grew up a Maple Leaf fan. I went to a lot of hockey games growing up because I played hockey um, when I was younger. Um, that was hockey was more uh, my main sport. Um, definitely growing up, uh, just I, I don't know from being from Canada. I guess hockey was just a, a, obviously a lot bigger sport than what baseball was. So that was what most kids played when we grew up. Um, so I grew up a Maple Leaf fan. Went to probably as many Maple Leaf games as I did Blue Jay games growing up. Um, <clears throat> but I haven't actually been to a Winnipeg Jets game yet. So maybe, hopefully, maybe sometime this year I'll be able to, to get to one. Yeah, I've, well, I've never been to a Maple Leaf or a Winnipeg Jets game uh, uh, either. But you've been to the Hockey Hall of Fame, I'm guessing, because I know it's right in downtown Toronto. Yeah, yes, I have been there. So uh, now that's and that's a, one of the few Hall of Fames, at least sports-related, that I've not been. So I look at you now, you're about 6'6", six, six, a little over 200 pounds. So when you were playing hockey, I know they used the term enforcer. Were you the enforcer? Uh, I wasn't actually, I was still, I mean, I was tall growing up, um, but I liked to score goals. I played forward. I played right, right wing when I was uh, really little. And then as I got older, I think when I was about 10 or 11 years old, um, I transitioned, I actually played center. So I liked having a little bit more freedom to kind of go all over the ice as opposed to being stuck kind of on one side. Um, but I wanted to get the puck and go and make plays and score goals. Yeah. I'm one of these guys and I, I love going to hockey games. I don't know a lot about the, the sport, but I, I like to go for the environment. And, and I mean, you've been in enough clubhouses in the Orioles system that, that, you know, late in the year, uh, late in the baseball year, guys are putting their rotisserie football teams, their fantasy football teams together. And I know yeah. that 
NFL certainly isn't in Canada. I'm not talking to CFL, but NFL being in Canada isn't as big, of course, as it is in the U.S. So guys, you know, tend to talk football all the time. Uh, not as many Canadians playing, but is it kind of the same thing with the Canadians in the baseball locker room? You guys, when you talk other sports, you talk hockey. Um, a little bit, yeah. It just it's uh, it's a little bit different because there's just usually not as many um, Canadians just in the baseball locker room in general. There's just there's a lot less of us. Um, in all the teams that we go to. So, you know, there are hockey fans, I guess, obviously, um, all over the world. Um, so we do get to talk about hockey a little bit every now and then. Uh, football is definitely a big topic of conversation. Um, and the other big one's golf. A lot of guys love talking about golf. <laughs> yeah, golf's a little more worldwide. I think, yeah. I think that's the common denominator. Most American players aren't going to talk hockey, and a lot of Canadian players aren't going to talk about the NFL. But golf, yeah, because – as you mentioned, on the day off, what do you do? You all play golf. There's yeah, not a yeah. company associated with that. You all enjoy playing uh, the golf. Winnipeg and, and Shaw Park, man, great fans and you know, great weather in the summertime. Uh, what is your favorite thing about coming to the ball, aside from playing in the game or getting ready to play, what do you like about the fans? What do you like about the atmosphere at the stadium? I just like how supportive everybody is uh, like for them to come up. I know we get um, you know, some of the different parks and stuff that we go and play throughout the American association. Uh, I believe that Winnipeg has one of the best, if not the best fan base, I think in our whole entire league. And a lot of it is just from the the amount of support and the number of people that actually come out to watch us play. Um, so I know we've, we've had a lot of uh, times throughout the season where we'll fill the whole entire stadium um, and that type of atmosphere, just being able to go out and play and, and perform um, in front of a really large crowd is is electric, I guess, is maybe the best word uh, to describe that. Um, it's just it's a lot of fun, you know, having people cheer for you when you get outs and when we get hits and stuff like that, especially when we score runs or somebody hits a home run or makes a big play defensively and just hearing how into the game everybody is. Um, it's just such a such a good atmosphere being able to come out of the dugout, you know, right before the game starts and to turn around and see how many fans there are uh, that are all up there wanting to come out and see us play. It's just it's a it's a really, really, really cool experience. Yeah, that's what I've heard from uh, from uh, everybody. And uh, finally, uh, last year uh, made the playoffs. Obviously, you guys are hoping to get a little further, but uh, you were a big part of that. Of course, Max Murphy, player of the year, a big part of that. And we all know what happened to him in, in game one. But I talked to him. It sounds like he's healthy and ready to go. But generally speaking, um, last year, uh, what what clicked for the team? What what got them to the playoffs? There were certain points that were like, hey, we got a good group of guys on and off the field here, and we're going to get this, uh, uh, get to the postseason. Yeah, I think one of the, um, first off, I think we just had a really good team. I think top to bottom, uh, I think we, we had a lot of really good players. We, we pitched really well. We hit very well. We ran the base as well. We played defensively, extremely solid. Uh, so we were just a really well-rounded, talented team. Um, but the one thing I think that helped us get over that little bit of a hump um, was just the camaraderie that we were able to have in our clubhouse. And it's just like we were a very close-knit group of guys. Um, you know, there wasn't – some teams you'll go and play for and and whatnot. There'll be some clicks and, and you know, not, not – never division. It's just uh, – not all the time is everybody always together. And that was something I think that we have worked really, really, really hard in Winnipeg um, to create is having that type of camaraderie in our clubhouse. And we'd go on the road and we would be doing barbecues and stuff out in the parking lots and we would go out to eat together. We'd have golf days or we'd bring out as many guys as we can. And um, I think that was a really big contributing factor to how well we did last year was just how close everybody was. Like one, we were a good team Two, We were really close and we were all really good friends of both on and off the field. Uh, and I think that really had a big, a big part to play in, in our success last year. Well, Travis, uh, we look forward to another playoff season, hopefully a championship season uh, as well. So uh, great stuff. And uh, uh, again, I look forward to uh, seeing a part of Canada that I've never been. I've been to Toronto a few times, in, including one game at Old Exhibition Stadium, uh, but uh, which I know existed before you were born. Uh, but uh, definitely uh, look forward to uh, getting the season going and uh, continued success uh, reaching uh, your uh, diploma in the next year and a half. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Segment three with uh, Travis uh, Seabrook. Gold Eyes ticket packages are available now by visiting goldeyes.com 
or calling 204-982-BASE. That's 204-982-BASE. I'm Doug Greenwald, radio play-by-play voice of your Winnipeg Gold Eyes. We thank you for joining us.